If you want to get a job with a big organization, you need to show them that you can solve their problems and generally one of their big problems is how do we make ourselves stand out from the people that we're competing against. Hello YouTube, this is a re-recording of a lecture that I presented at the PXL University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Belgium. So today we're talking about the full guide to master branding in esports and how to get a full-time job at your favorite organization. I made a quick rundown of the topics we're going to go over today. There's some timestamps in the description starting with some background about myself, what I'm actually going to be teaching, some observations on the industry, the importance of social media, as well as how to actually strategize for these brands yourself, and a few tips and tricks that I've picked up on in the past decade that I've been in esports. I'm going to do quite a bit of cross-referencing throughout this presentation, so make sure to listen through as much as you can if you're really interested in learning and mastering esports design and branding. Some quick background on where I work. Currently, I'm a graphic and motion designer for 100 Thieves, an esports gaming and apparel organization with over 1 million followers on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and hopefully soon Twitter as well. I'm also a brand designer for Paper Crowns, an award-winning agency that was recently given the title of Esports Creative Team of the Year for 2020 by the very well-recognized Esports Awards platform. And lastly, I have my personal brand, Noac Design, which is centered around teaching the psychology of design to creatives, specifically in esports, and how to get people to better understand their work their process and the industry. So now that I've gone through the background of what I do, this is what I'm going to be teaching today, and that is how to become an esports designer in 2020 and the brand standards or strategy you'll need to get hired, get paid, and all that good stuff, right? So I thought it would make sense to talk a little bit about the industry and the comparisons that I've been able to make this past decade of being in the esports creative community. So there are a few main points that I wanted to bring up about the design industry, the first being that it is still very new. It hasn't been around as long as traditional sports and because of that I would say that it is still underdeveloped but has been quickly developing in recent times so what I've noticed back from 2012 to 2014 was that esports generally had no identity and no specific visual style and because of that it would take from traditional sports graphics from things like football and other sports television networks but in recent times these brands and these organizations as well as the industry as a whole has been able to develop its own style and visual language which I'll be showing some examples of in a bit going back to this idea that esports is a growing industry it's also evolving and the pace in which it's evolving in is moving much faster than it used to that being said it's very important to stay involved in the community esports is very tightly knit and the network of the industry is actually a lot smaller than you would probably think the last note and maybe the most important one to keep in mind is that the esports industry has become profitable so back in 2012 most of the community was doing this purely for fun there was rarely any pay involved and the reason for that was because the industry barely had any money in it hardly anyone in creative fields or in marketing got paid and the premise of why this was okay was because for most of us it was just a hobby and we were exploring our craft finding out what we love to do and if we wanted to eventually make it a career for ourselves in the future so obviously things have changed very dramatically since then and esports has become this multi-billion dollar industry that is still on the rise every day now as esports has become more profitable it's especially important for these brands to separate themselves from their competitors so I have a few examples of social media graphics from a few of my favorite teams, 100 Thieves, Chaos Esports Club, Sentinels, Evil Geniuses, Luminosity, and Dignitas. And going back to these previous points, so growing, developing a style, becoming profitable, what you'll see here, as I mentioned earlier, is that over time, esports organizations have come to understand the importance of branding and distancing their own unique visual style from their competitors. But what you'll notice is that the main goal for an organization is to develop its own personality, similar to how YouTubers, content content creators and streamers all have this specific personality that ties into their brand whether it's the colors the visual language or even in chaos esports in the lime green towards the center with their very unique typography style most of these graphics have refined their brands into something that is completely exclusive from other traditional sports industries like i said earlier esports would mimic these industries back in 2012 to 2014 and because of that most brands back then looked exactly the same they all had the same personality and now we're starting to see a 
break from that trend. And this is kind of what I've been leading into. So the importance of social media and why this stuff is all relevant. So we were looking at social media graphics earlier and I was explaining why each of these organizations have their own style and unique look to them. And the reason why social media graphics especially are so important to these companies can be seen in this massive following that almost all of them seem to share. When you look at these teams, so I just pulled a few like Fnatic, 100 Thieves, obviously, Cloud9, Liquid, and it doesn't just stop there. There's tons of organizations that have followings just like this, if not larger. And the reason why it's like this is because as a business, these platforms are the best way for these brands to actively engage and communicate with an audience that's almost entirely online and on social media in the first place. But going back, that's kind of the overall importance of these brands separating themselves. Imagery and visuals are such a big part of social media strategy. And if you're going to become a designer or a creative, you'll need to be able to strategize how you can build onto these social media accounts and give them their own personalities and styles. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about right here. So making it and how to actually design and strategize for these esports brands and more specifically the standards you can expect when you want to create successful esports graphics. This is very important for people looking to get hired and I say this all the time on my streams is that if you want to get a job with a big organization, you need to show them that you can solve their problems and generally one of their big problems is how do we make ourselves stand out from the people that we're competing against. Currently in 2020, there's this huge gap in those that communicate versus those that decorate their ideas and in esports, I'm just telling you now, if you want to quickly get ahead, I always encourage you to learn more about communicating your design strategy and to do it now while the industry is still catching up. So some of the key points I think about when I making graphics and I'm strategizing for these organizations is that it should be memorable, recognizable, eye-catching, and different. Most of these tie in together, but making it memorable, allowing the viewer to make a connection that this style, this specific visual language has an attachment to the brand's name, at the same time making it recognizable. So what I'm doing is I'm imagining the viewer's perspective, and I'll bring this up a few times throughout the presentation from this point on. Something that's really important is putting yourself in the shoes of a person that is scrolling through their timeline on social media. Like I said, it's the main way that these esports organizations get involved with their audience. And if you picture someone scrolling through their phone and they see a graphic that tells them without them having to read it and they say, oh, okay, I know that this is something about 100 Thieves. That's generally the approach that you try to have when you're making these graphics is how can I design something that people will see and eventually associate with a certain brand? At the same time, it needs to be eye-catching and going back to this similar idea that if you're scrolling through a timeline, it needs to be something that gets people to pause what they're doing. The last one here, like I said, most of these tie in together, but making sure the design and that the style is different, making sure that you're creating something that's unique. And in order to do all these previous points, you need to create something that doesn't mimic the styles of competitors or what's already being done in the community. These things will seem very obvious at first, but anyone who's already a part of the esports community will be able to agree with me. There's a lot of copying done here, and I'm telling you again, if you want to jump ahead as quickly as possible, you'll try to avoid that trap as much as you can in the first place. Going back to these, if you remember all these previous points, so memorable, recognizable, eye-catching, and different, these social media graphics, you'll see that they all touch on those points, and I can try to spot out a few right now. So, for example, in the top center, Chaos Esports Club, with their really vibrant colors and unique serif typography style that you don't see very often in esports. Evil Geniuses with their super unique color palette, their very bold eye-catching typography. For 100 Thieves, we focus a lot on our imagery, so using geometric shapes as background elements, using small type as texture rather than having the typography take the center stage for most of our graphics, and I'll get into that a little bit more specifically later on. But yeah, if you think about those main points and you look to some of your favorite esports brands, they're probably all hitting those goals. So that's generally how you make it. And now I wanted to move on to some of my favorite tips and tricks that I picked up over the past 10 years, which I'm very excited to show all of you today. So the main points that I picked up for the esports industry, just to run through the list, is that sometimes it's better to have something that's different than good. Emotional based design, which is probably the most important thing that I teach to others, how to create this brand that triggers specific emotions and gets people reacting a certain way. Also, something that I call categorizing in design, which has its own psychological effects that I can show you. And just a cool little trick to end it off on is reflected graphics and a really quick way to make your designs feel different from the last one. So we'll get into this first idea that it's better to be different than it is to be good. I feel like it's the opposite for most industries. A lot of long-standing businesses like to play it safe and just focus on being the highest quality possible, even if it's not entirely creative. 
But the esports industry is still new and still growing. It's separating itself from other industries, and because of that, it has a lot of different circumstances. Like I said, esports is so community based, so a lot of designers and creatives have been here just as long, if not longer, than I've been. And I feel very comfortable in saying that the general skill level of design in esports is well beyond most other industries, just because the people in it, like myself, started when they were 10 to 12 years old and have nearly a decade of experience in one specific industry. Another issue that comes with this, however, is that because because esports is so tightly knit, there's a lot of copying, a lot of taking inspiration from other designers, and it's gotten to the point where although the general skill level and quality has improved over time and it's been getting better and better, there's also a lot of generic esports styles that you see from people over and over and over again. But what I'm kind of getting at here is there's a lot of designers in esports that make work that is good, but not a lot of designers in esports that make work that is different. So you see the potential for opportunity here. The people that do things differently are solving the problems of these organizations when it comes to standing out from their competitors, but there's less availability of those types of designers in the industry. So if you want to quickly make your way to the top, get creative first and slowly improve your craft and the quality of your work over time. This next tip is something that I'm super passionate about and it's something I learned in university called emotional based design. Anyone that's into branding should know the importance of brands having a personality. And when I say brand personality, I literally mean the brand should express emotions. It should be sad, angry, happy. And this is something again that is not seen very often in esports because it's still a new industry and people are having to make that connection compared to these really refined, long-standing professional industries. If you're interested in becoming a designer or creative in esports, this is something that will easily separate yourself from the people that you're competing against when it comes to getting these jobs. Here's what I'm talking about when I say emotional-based design. So I'm being thoughtful on how I approach a design direction based on the context of the situation. Just a few examples here. So these are some graphics we use for our live events. And the main thing you'll notice is that 100 Thieves, our main branding is red, black, and white. And we'll use that to our advantage when we create our marketing strategy for these matches. So you'll see the ones in black and white are a lot more neutral. And on the other side, we'll use this burst of red for our graphics to identify a big win and to give off this emotion of high energy and celebration. You know, this is something that we really want to pop out on our timeline. So now when someone's scrolling through, they'll see this composition of bright red and they'll know that something good must have happened. And these are all micro decisions that happen very, very quickly and are mostly not thought about. But if you can slow things down and consider each step of how the viewer is going to react to your design, you'll be able to create a full brand strategy that is built around the audience of that organization. And that's something that esports teams love to hear about. It's the same for win versus loss graphics, so try to be thoughtful about how you want your graphics to represent a win versus how you want them to look for a loss. For 100 Thieves, we actually don't create loss graphics at all because we don't feel it's important to highlight those moments. You know, they aren't really meant to get people's attention in the first place, so that's kind of emotional based design, and as long as you hold on to that type of thinking while you design, you'll do very, very well in esports. So, next up, here's something I call categorizing in design for esports, and this is important because of the impact of social media, like I said earlier, and more specifically, the amount of content that all of these teams have to put out on a daily basis. So, whether it's a variety of different competitive games, content for YouTubers and streamers, or even just celebratory occasions like birthdays and really any announcements from the organization as a whole, there's a lot of different groups of information for the viewer to have to digest. What we can do to make that information easier to understand and also how to direct it really quickly is by using these visual cues in our graphics to lead people to understanding the context of the image before even needing to read anything. So I've got a couple more graphics from 100 Thieves here and to kind of emphasize this point, you'll notice that these are two different game categories, the left being Counter-Strike, the right being Valorant. And you can see that although these graphics look similar enough to be identified under the same brand, they're styled just differently enough to be grouped kind of into their own sub styles and have slightly different design elements that separate them from each other. So the idea here, going back to the viewer's perspective, is that we can train the eyes to recognize these patterns. So someone who's seen 100 Thieves before can scroll onto one of these images and just through the overall layout can kind of say to themselves, oh, this looks like a Counter-Strike graphic or this looks like a Valorant graphic, right? And all of this relates to brand recognition and how to make content for the brand easier to digest for the viewer. And I've got two more examples here to reiterate this idea. So on the left side for our birthday graphics, you see how we use the colors of the photography and clip that to the person's name. And we generally save that exclusively for the graphics that highlight certain people. And on the other side, if we use a photo of the entire team, it's generally due to a big win. And you can also see some of the other brand elements coming into play at the same time, such as the 
bright red or the really large typography hovering over the back of the players to highlight the importance of the graphic for the viewer. But that pretty much covers categorizing in esports design. So now I'm going to move into our last tip and this is something very, very quick, but it can help a lot. And it's something I don't see being done very often, despite being so simple. And that is reflecting graphics or imagery in a design. You'll see in these examples that it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like and it's this idea of taking the imagery used in a graphic and flipping it to the other side as a way to diversify and reset the information on the composition. The reason why this is really important is if you think about the context of social media again and recognize that the graphics you're making aren't going to be seen one by one, they're often going to be strung together in this infinite timeline. This is a really easy way to prevent your designs from looking repetitive or lazy when they're being posted on top of one another, right? And here's kind of what I mean by that. So at first glance, when you take a look at these social media feeds, they'll seem diverse enough to not give off the feeling of being repetitive or copy pasted from previous graphics. But when you look closer at each one, you'll notice that a lot of the elements are the same, but have just been reversed to the opposite side to help reset the viewer's eyes and make it harder to connect any similarities between the two. And since these graphics stick on social media, you'll need to be very thoughtful about how they all interact with each other, which is why I always encourage designers to create two variations of their graphics with reflected layouts whenever they have the ability to do something like that. So we're coming up on the end of the presentation. Here are the points we talked about. And again, for YouTube, the timestamps will be marked throughout the video. This has been how to become an esports designer in 2020. You can find me just about anywhere at Noac Design. I'm live on Twitch every Saturday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, teaching content similar to what you've just seen now. Thank you all for watching. I hope it helped and I'll see you in the next video.